Thank you very much. Obviously I'm a bit worried about how much information your brains and mine can take in. It's a lot of talk to digest. I was just thinking very quickly if I could ask you as a brain clearing exercise to sing this note. I won't spend a long time on this, maybe two minutes. tell you what the note is because it has a different name in Norway. <laughs> Just let me sing that together. It's a very good to uh, if you're reactivating the brain cell. Very nice. And now some of you, and I'm not going to do that dividing the room in a half um, because I detest audience participation. <laughs> what do I detest? <laughs> That's right. So I want some of you, as you feel, to add the perfect fifth, the F sharp, the fis, fisk, above that, and let's just get that. And if you think there are too many people on the F sharp, go back to the B. And now, and now hold it as long as possible, and really listen to yourself and everybody else. Here we go. As long as possible. Oh, that was absolutely beautiful. And that was a piece by Lamont Young, written in 1960. It's called Piece Number no. 7. And it consists of a B and an F sharp drawn as whole notes with a tie leading nowhere and the instruction to be held for a very long time. And he wrote that as part of his work within the Fluxus movement. And it's beyond a joke, it's uh, more than a joke <coughs> or a game. You really do start to hear worlds within that tiny simple piece of information. Anyway, I only raised that to just try and clear your brains. So I'm going to start my little talk now. One of my favourite thinkers is Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman. Three things. There's three things I like about him. One, he used to tell his bosses, don't ask me to invigilate exams or head meetings to discuss curriculum, etc. because I will be actively irresponsible. That means, he would explain, I won't just be absent by accident, I will actively not turn up. If I wake up in the morning with a wild idea that I want to experiment with, then that is the thing that I need to pursue. Two, he made his best-known discovery, the discovery that led to him winning the Nobel Prize for Physics, by playing around with a wobbly plate in a cafeteria. Note the word play. Three, he liked to play African drums and sing very badly. In fact, there's a, one of his last recorded interviews Halfway through the interview, it's so beautiful, he gets thirsty. He's an old man now, like uh, the father of Homer Simpson, I picture him like that, in an old people's home. And he just starts bashing the table like a pair of djembes and singing, I want my orange juice, where's my orange juice? And that's the end of the interview, it ends there. So obviously I love this guy. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, I should tell you, that I'm a musician, maybe a jazz musician, who from 2005 to 2010 spent five amazing years as a professor at the Rhythmic Music Conservatory in Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm now loving life as a professor at the University of the Arts in Bern, Switzerland. So that's my introduction. I always knew that in order to have my dream life of being an improvising musician and composer, I would have to have a second job. That is the reality of jazz in the UK, and it never, never bothered me. In fact, in the early years, washing dishes during the day and playing jazz in the evening was the ultimate romantic experience for me. It still surprises me that later on, I had to leave the washing up behind due to increasing requests to teach music, mostly in jazz schools. How did this happen? I'd never trained as a teacher, and I'd never studied jazz with a teacher. This was not for aesthetic reasons, it was simply that jazz education 
didn't really exist in England in 1979. I was, against, I was not against learning. I did start a four-year degree course in composition at the Royal College of Music, but left after two weeks, dismayed at a brass plaque screwed into a Steinway. But read. This piano is not to be used for playing <laughs> jazz music. That was a professional, we should have been a little bit nearer like that. That's true. I mean, that's a photoshopped version of it, but the actual truth is ingrained into my memory like a plaque screwed into a piano. One tiny but monumental sliver of jazz education came to me from Kenny Wheeler. It was 1971, and I was an 11-year-old at a jazz summer school in London. Me and a friend had transcribed lots of Charlie Parker tunes and was scaring the hell out of older saxophone owners by playing them as fast as possible at every opportunity. During that summer school, I played trumpet in a big band, but when an instruction to solo came up on my music, I didn't play anything. Kenny Wheeler, who was guiding the band, rather than take the solo himself, he asked me why I didn't play it. And I said, I'd never seen a G flat with a little triangle and some numbers and a slash and a something that seems to have nothing to do with it underneath. I have no idea what this means. Kenny took me to the piano and explained how to interpret chord symbols as modes. It took just five minutes and I've never forgotten his clarity and generosity. Incidentally, the mode for that particular chord would be the most enriching um, a mode on the piano, which is this one. They are probably full of questions, as I am, and that we are about to dip our toes into a massive lake of knowledge together. That sounds very hippie, and you may well ask, if the student and I are equals, why am I the teacher in this situation? Swedish psychologist Anders Eriksson has done well-documented research into learning. He discovered that in order to become good at something, you need to invest 10,000 hours in it. I guess some of you know about this. Uh, that could be 20 hours a week for 10 years, for instance. Malcolm Gladwell, in his best-selling book, The Outliers, gives contemporary examples of people who've excelled in their field. Bill Gates, for example. <coughs> And he comes to similar conclusions about the hours of practice required. Do you remember Chesley Burnick Sully Sullenberger the yeah. Third? Anybody remember him? <laughs> You're thinking drama with the Odeon Pope trio, maybe. Uh, he was—I can't believe you can't remember this poor guy. He was the pilot who safely landed his Airbus A320 on the Hudson River, okay. saving the lives of all 155 passengers. I love that guy. He later said that he'd spent his whole professional life banking knowledge and that on that day he made a massive withdrawal. There's been many jokes made about the fact that most people in that situation would have made a massive deposit. <laughs> <laughs> so, the reason that I am the teacher in this situation is because, it's because I've had my toe dipped in that lake for more than 10,000 hours. My job is just to encourage the student to make a similar commitment. And the reason I called today's talk, I'm halfway through now, by the way, how dare you play in a classroom, is that I've noticed an increasing tendency to do a lot of talking in music classes. I think this came about because as Europe and the world has veered towards the right politically in recent years, well, until two days ago, Ministers for Education in several countries have become louder in their questioning of the value of education in the arts. That's definitely true in England. There has been much discussion about which subjects are valid in a university and which are not. So then the leaders who are trying to keep their education institutions alive and to keep them reasonably funded have started to search for ways of becoming legitimate in the eyes of the establishment. Nearly all these roads towards legitimacy have seemed to involve abandoning playing and replacing it with talking, reflecting and researching. Please don't misunderstand me. I love to reflect on music, but you've got to play some music before you can reflect on it. I love research when it's done out of genuine interest. 
when it's done out of a fear of losing funding and the line goes out from the top office that all research projects need to be focused within a pre-decided pre and prescribed area. It saddens me. Pretty soon you can find yourself in a room discussing the third draft of a project proposal when all you really want to be doing is teaching piano in a classroom next door, playing. I've had to read a lot of reflections on the creative process that go something like this. By week three, I was beginning to despair that I would find inspiration, so I took myself off to my parents' summer house with just a guitar, some candles, and a sack of vinapol. Was I finally going to find my true voice, or did I really need to be back in the big city? Next page, and on it goes. And the result of this research is a three-minute track on a CD that maybe doesn't work. So here's an alternative. One really fun way to research a multitude of different <laughs> aspects of jazz, groove, and improv-based music is this. You get 19 students together every Friday of every week, and between 10 and 1, you play through a great pile of very challenging and varied music. When you find a particular challenge that the band is struggling with, you compose pieces designed specifically to target that difficulty. Here's an example. The bands tend to tap their feet loudly, which serves no purpose and sounds unpleasant. That's a particular bugbear of mine. I hate it. So you write a piece where they must count silently in their heads for increasingly long periods of time before re-entering with this spoken text. I must not tap my feet. <laughs> Sounded a bit fascistic, that piece. Um, another example, more friendly. The, ten, the students tend not to look at each other whilst playing difficult music. So you write a piece that specifically tells them who to look at and in which bar on which beat to look. A third example, the written music starts to sound good, but the solos are weak. So you look in detail at the harmony, perhaps with the students only soloing over the passing chords, the in-between chords, the ones that get ignored, and they maybe remain silent over the chords that they know very well. I could go on with these examples. These fun processes will lead to much discussion within the band about performance techniques, presentation, etc. We could call these discussions reflection. We could call the whole process research. The next stage of this research is that you record this band properly. This means, for example, having individual headphone mixes, just like a professional big band would hope to have. And as you do this whole thing properly, it doesn't teach students how to do it properly. It might be important now to mention that I have done this particular research. It's not just theoretical, it's real. From 2005 to 2010, I ran such a band at the Rhythmic Music Conservatory in Copenhagen. I called it Storm Chaser because that was one of the few words I could find that had the letters RMC consecutively within it. The other words were worm cast and sperm count, <laughs> neither of which seemed suitable. Now, as you know, I'm working in Bern at the Hochkabe, the HKB uh, Hochschule der Kunst in Bern, and I've been really struggling to find a word that has HKB. The closest I've got is fish kebab, <laughs> which sounds like a very Trondheim kind of piece of food. So back to my experience of meaningful research. There's just two pages to go. Thank you for your patience. Next, you send the Storm Chaser album to European promoters and wait for their response. In an ideal scenario, which incidentally this was, these promoters call you back and say, is this really a student band? And you say, yes, but we don't feel the need to stress that. In fact, I used to say, this band now knows my music better than any other big band in the world. Then you take this band on the road. Again, you do this properly so the students learn how to do things properly. That even means that the students get paid. Very controversial in jazz, I know. And how, you ask? Simple, by endless rehearsing and training, you make the band so good that the festival pays to have them. If, for example, in Norway, the institution can find some additional funds towards travel, etc., all the better. I'm sorry if this sounds immodest, but it might have helped a bit that I was the keyboard player in this band. 
that simply meant that there was at least one name in the lineup that some people had heard of at these festivals. It also meant that the students saw me practice what I preach. I could only ask them to play something if I was able to do it myself. The students responded well to having an eccentric maverick in the faculty, and they trusted me to be actively irresponsible, hatching plots that would ultimately reach them in unexpected ways. I was having fun. I really was. And it's not a sin to be happy when you're teaching. In fact, you can teach more efficiently when you're inspired and happy. And guess what? It wasn't just me. The band were also having fun. And you can really learn efficiently when you're inspired and happy. This wasn't just a small selected group who got to play in Storm Chaser either. Lots of students passed through the band. Let me think of a few. I don't know if you'll know this guy yet. Probably will come to know him. Marius Nesset. Also in the band, Daniel Herskedal, Bendik Gisk, Eric Kingstil, yes. <laughs> Christian Tangvik. Even some non-Norwegian students were allowed in this band, <laughs> based as it was in Copenhagen. Anton Eger, Swedish, Petter Eld, Asger Drasbeck, Danish. And women were allowed in the band too. <laughs> Julie Kerr, Josephine Lindstrand, Nina Baum, Malena Brask. It was part of the thinking behind the band that it should uh, make a difference in that area. And just a small sidetrack here, which from what was being said earlier, I got interested in, we don't have any time for answers and questions, but uh, something I would hope comes up in your discussions. When I come to go to a jazz school and I go get off the train at the station and I see people of all different colours and from all different parts of the world playing their part in society, making sure the trains are working, for instance, or going to work, or commuting, or arriving, or leaving. And I go to the institution, and I see um, the question to ask, is it the responsibility of the people who are choosing who should come here, or does it start at a younger age, or what is actually going in? I don't think we have time right now, but I would love to see that. A school would be more of a reflection of society, and it would be more interesting for the students. Um, these, these are the people who played in the band, and they're the people that I will book next time I need to find the best players for a big band gig, if I'm able to book them. They're very busy out there being master musicians, and I believe they reflect very well on my years at the RMC. Last page, last page. <clears throat> so what did I mean starting on about this? How dare you play in a classroom? Do maths, carve wood, take photos. I just noticed someone doing that this morning. Taking, practice martial arts, engage in politics, make love, not war, strive for peace, mold clay, sculpt rock, play music. It means a lot to me that the verb attached to music is play. Most of the activities here are not playful, but music in this language requires us to play. Just like we play tennis, which is physical, play word games, which are fun, or play chess, which is intellectual. So let us embrace the word play. And let us not be ashamed to celebrate it in our world of education. Thank you very much.